Hello everyone, welcome back to Spar and Brawl. I hope you're having a decent day. As always, I'm joined by my co-host Sam, but today we also have the pleasure of being joined by Professor Christian Parenti. Christian, thank you again for joining us and giving us your time. My pleasure. Thank you. So I'm just going to read a quick introduction about Christian, but then we're going to talk about his life a little bit more too before getting into the main part of the interview. So Christian Parenti is a full tenured professor of economics at John Jay College, City University of New York. His most recent and fifth book is called Radical Hamilton, Economic Lessons for a Misunderstood Founder. He has also recently published a very interesting article entitled How the Organized Left Got COVID Wrong, Learned to Love Lockdowns and Lost Its Mind, an Autopsy. And that's the main article that we're going to talk about. So Christian, thank you again. And folks, please like and subscribe. And you can find tam- timestamps down below. We're mainly going to talk about the article, but then also touch on some current political issues going on towards the end of the towards the interview. So Christian, what is there anything you would like to share with us to get started about, you know, your own political leaning and your own life as much as you find that it's relevant here? But then if not, let's transition to Iraq well, I mean, after that. You had, I mean, you had... St- you had off air had you had made a mention about hearing that I had described myself as a classical Marxist and a classical liberal. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a Marxist in that uh, I think that the Marxist tradition is really powerful for understanding capitalism. And, you know, essentially that class struggle is the, you know, one of the main, not the only, but one of the main motors of, of politics and that, uh, you know, my my so my my political con- concerns are with the well-being of the species as a whole, and I think that the way to achieve that is through class struggle. For the majority of people, the majority of people on this planet do not own productive capital; they have only their labor to sell. And so, class struggle is about improving the conditions of the majority of people in any country and all over the world. And in terms of classical liberal, in many ways. The Marxist tradition is, it's in opposition to liberalism, but it's, it's a kind of imminent critique from within. It's saying, well, that this, this whole liberal tradition is not, in fact, delivering on the promises of the Enlightenment. You've got to go one step further. You've got to have an economic analysis, and there has to be political economic change for the promises about human emancipation to become material realities for the majority of people. So... Uh, in that regard, you know, Marxism and liberalism, though they're often antagonistic, are also very compatible. And so, I mean, I'm a classical liberal in that sense, and I'm also a classical liberal in that I take civil liberties very seriously. And um, the, the, the abandonment by the American left of civil liberties is relatively recent, and it's highly problematic. It worries me a lot. I think it is foolish in a tactical sense because civil liberties are useful for people and movements that protest and go up against power. And also because the kinds of freedoms embodied in our Bill of Rights are positive goods in and of themselves. The left's relationship to freedom, I think, has gotten misunderstood and forgotten. First of all, the left in this country, in the US, has always been at the vanguard of struggling to make the promises of the Bill of Rights, which is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. And just a little interruption caveat, the Bill of Rights were not part of the initial Constitution. The Constitution is written and then they they can't get it ratified. The agreement is that nine of the 13 new states have to ratify it and then it'll become law. All the states agree that if nine of the states ratify it, then all will, will submit to the Constitution. And when the Constitution is first rolled out, the populists read it and they see designs for a very, very powerful government and very few protections for people, civil liberties. And a powerful government is, in some ways, as I argued in my most recent book, Radical Hamilton, very useful for economic planning. But there's also the risk that it can run roughshod over over people's autonomy and freedom and well-being. And so the Constitution couldn't get ratified without there being a promise that, well, there will be this immediate passage of these 10 amendments protecting civil liberties. And, you know, the First Amendment protecting freedom of conscience and freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, 
very, very important, but also the Fourth Amendment, protecting people uh, in their you know, person and effects against undue search and seizure. These are really, really important. And long story short, the left played an important role historically in making these rights a reality. So the First Amendment was not considered, it was a federal law, but it was not, uh, states did not have to abide by it until the, um, really until I think it was like the early 30s. Uh, the dates are actually in the, in that, the COVID article, um, but it was through, you know, struggles by the, the Wobblies, the, um, you know, radical syndicalists, trade unionists, communists, anarchists, that the First Amendment is, quote unquote, nationalized, made the law of the land so that it applies everywhere. Because at first it was just, you have these rights in federal territory, in Washington, D.C., in the territories controlled by the federal government. But states then had the right to suppress free speech and say, no, you can't hand out your pro-union literature. You can't stand on a street corner lecturing passerbys about socialism. If you do, you're going to get arrested. It was struggled by the left broadly defined that made the First Amendment national. So that's an important thing that the left seems to have forgotten. But there's another aspect of this, which is that freedom has always been central to a left agenda. The point of a more egalitarian political economy, socialism, if you prefer, is to some extent that is merely an ends to something else. Economic equality is an end to something else, which is human freedom, human emancipation, right? That underneath the struggle against war and imperialism and the struggle against class exploitation is the struggle for human freedom. That that's the whole point is that, uh, you know, that people can emerge from the tyranny of want into a, a realm of actual freedom and self exploration. So, that's always been there. And I, I, you know, it has fallen by the wayside, at least in the US in this moment. I blame social media for a lot of that, but I, it's probably more complex than that. There's, there's a new kind of censorious vigilantism that has taken hold. So that's, I think that, so that's, that's sort of where I'm coming from on those, on those kinds of questions. And in terms of other things, it's like, I mean, in many ways, my my politics are are boring in that I'm I'm more focused on what is possible in the here and now. I'm less concerned with what the ideal society would look like. In a recent podcast, I was asked to des describe my ideal political economy, and it, very honestly, it's not something I have thought much about. Mm -hmm. and one reason for that is because it's really easy to imagine beautiful, wonderful scenarios, but so what, you know, what's much more difficult is to imagine egalitarian arrangements that are within the realm of possibility and imagining how do we get from here to there? What, what is a realistic destination in terms of social justice and equality from this situation? So the, those are the kinds of questions I'm concerned with. And if you're serious about that, you know, uh, it, it gets, a, you know, it, it, it gets quite limited quite quickly. Um, so that's kind of boring, right? But my answer to such questions is not about imagining, reimagining the scale of human settlement and the integration of agriculture and home life and, you know, high tech manufacturing. There's all sorts of directions one could go in imagining a future political economy, but that all seems abstract given the obstacles we face here and now. And those obstacles are what concern me less so than the place we might go if we can clear those obstacles. And do you think so? Do you think some of these obstacles have kind of increased over the past um, few years? Or I mean, is or, or are the older ones even coming back? I mean, just because of the shooting of yes, of two days ago, I was thinking, I mean, you know, this is like, the conversations are so deja vu from 10 years ago. I know you weren't talking about that. You were talking about a lot of other things, but I just wanted to see what you yeah. think would be possible yeah. um, right now. 
yeah, things are things are pretty bad. It seems to me that the left peaked with the Bernie Sanders campaign and has gone into a, a strange and precipitous decline since then, as exemplified by the fact that Bernie and the squad all voted for this $40 billion of aid to Ukraine. And that is, you know, I mean, that's disgusting at so many levels. This is an unjust proxy war. The, uh, you know, Ukraine is, according to Transparency International, a U.S. State Department supported NGO, is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. So there's going to be massive theft. A lot of the money is never even going to leave the beltway. It's just going to these pampered, welfare-dependent military contractors. So it's a total waste of money. And it really it makes a mockery of everything that the social democratic left in the United States stands for. Climate, you know, progress on climate change, redistribution of wealth, et cetera, et cetera. The fact that there was not a single vote in the, in the squad against it is, call me naive, and I'll cop to it completely. It was shocking. I, I, was, I was genuinely shocked by that. I mean, because this is like, this war is um, bad for energy outcomes in that it's, uh, you know, going to create economic desperation around the world, which is going to make choosing more sustainable forms of investment more difficult and more expensive. The continuing this war will ramp up, intensify the building food crisis. So it is essentially a vote to condemn many, many people to hunger and even starvation. And none of that is good for progressive social change. I, I mean, Camier actually recently covered that African nations up to 70 to 90% of their wheat was dependent on Ukraine. But I also, like that was, do you think if there wasn't such a lift that is calling for censorship, especially I think since 2016 onwards, would have progressive, progressive part of the, uh, legislation uh, would have voted because they didn't even like debate it or you know it was so like was done as a matter of fact as as a routine sort of thing that it was a bit to me as well shocking that you know they didn't even like to do like oh uh, we have some concerns or oh we got some assurances now there was nothing of that nature so do you think maybe it was because I feel like Bernie F like because of online attacks his rhetoric has really I don't know. That's how I just thought I asked. I mean, sorry, if I could just add to that. Though, to me, it seems like the squad and other pro lefty pol and politicians in the U.S., I mean, they might they might stick their necks out for something domestically, possibly. And I mean, you talked about how foreign policy decisions, of course, even connected domestically, but perhaps a bit indirectly. So, I mean, in that sense, I wasn't even surprised that, you know, over domestic things that they promised, they kind of roll over. So, I mean, over... Ukraine and things that they barely talk about foreign policy. I just, I mean, I could see it coming that, you know, they're not even going to debate it. Yeah, well, you are, you're less naive than I am in that regard. <laughs> yeah, well, me too. Uh, yeah. No, well, Sam right. pointed I mean, out how this was based on a lot of things I didn't know about them actually talking about foreign policy. So <laughs> lack of knowledge led me to this, but sorry for interrupting yeah. you. <laughs> There's a long tradition of a kind of right-wing social democracy in the U.S. where intellectuals and politicians can lean quite far left on domestic questions, but then are always supportive of aggressive US foreign policy. That, that's a sad tradition. It is, it's not reducible to increased online censorship by the left. It's an older, deeper problem than that. I suppose that if the left had not embraced a culture of censorship, we might well have a more robust argument about the nature of U.S. foreign policy and particularly about the U.S. role in, uh, in helping to create this war through pushing NATO expansion, um, but probably wouldn't have been enough to, to prevent this. But it would, yeah, if there, if there wasn't such a tolerance for taking down, quote unquote, disinformation, there would be more examples available online of, of critical reporting on the Ukraine crisis, and that might have had some effect, it might have created a larger kind of, you know, peace-oriented section of the left, AOC, 
Ilhan Omar, others might have felt more pressure or more room and more support to take positions that Nancy Pelosi would not like. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but who, you know, we'll never know. Whatever the case, censorship is is bad because it uh, you know it forestalls. Well, it's just obviously bad. There's somebody sent me a photograph of a sign from a protest, and it's like a you know a handmade sign it says the worst part about censorship is, and then it's like the thing <laughs> is itself redacted. <laughs> I see. I <laughs> never made stronger by being made dumber. So definitely. And by the left here, I'm guessing you're not talking about the Democratic Party. And I guess this could also help who you're calling the lockdown left once we get there. Oh. You're talking about people who are who would want more left leaning policies than what the Democratic Party do. But when it comes to the censorship right. issue, no, though, there are there are elements in the Democratic Party that are genuinely left. There are there are staffers. There are also elected politicians at every level who, under different circumstances, would be voting for a thoroughly socialist agenda, right? Of like, you know, public industry and all that sort of stuff. So there's an element of the Democratic Party. I don't think the Democratic Party and not certainly not its commanding heights aren't left. Definitely. They're warmongering, tax cutting servants of the 1%. But there are a, a fair number of players within the Democratic Party across the country who who do have very left, solidly left politics. So the, the Democratic Party's an element in the organized left, all the way through all the various NGOs, the community groups, various pressure groups, the trade unions, et cetera, the publications, and also, of course, the media personalities. I just received uh, news of a, a sad example of this left-wing COVID fanaticism, it's the only way I could put it. Labor Notes, which is the premier left socialist Marxist left journal on organized labor is having its annual conference in Chicago. And this, is, this has not been reported out. I have written to Labor Notes and asked them some questions about this, but it's come to my attention that there were a group of Teamsters with Teamsters for a Democratic Union who were unvaccinated. Mm. And they, uh, the, the conference has a very strict no vaccine, no attendance policy. And they were unable to work out an arrangement with these Teamsters for a Democratic Union. And, and uh, according to what I was told that uh, it, many or all of this one specific group were African-American Teamsters who were gonna present on the question of race in the labor movement or you know being black in the Teamsters. I don't know what exactly their topic was gonna be, but they were not given uh, an exemption on, on you know, pre-existing immunity, on religious exemption or health conditions, nothing. So, uh, the, the conference's tagline is it's going to be big, but of course it's not going to be as big as it could be if members of the working class who have refused to get vaccinated are excluded. So, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that goes on under the radar. And, you know, the TDU doesn't want to talk about this. Labor Notes doesn't want to talk about this. Nobody wants to talk about this. I, I have sent news of this to some left friends and they don't even want to talk about it. Hmm. You know, everyone's just like, even Keep now, quiet. that's just hoping that's going to go away. I mean, we're like, we're in year three now. These people are, they're, you know, they're, they're not dealing with the fact that the CDC says these vaccines don't stop transmission. The official line is that these vaccines help prevent death mm -hmm. and hospitalization, but they do not stop transmission and they do not stop infection. There was just uh, Walgreens have da has data out about how the, the people with, uh, first and second doses actually have a higher rate of infection than people who come into Walgreens who are unvaccinated and just want to get PCR tests. So, or sorry, it's a rate of reinfection. Um, so Kim Iverson did something on that mm. on rising that people can look up. So, I mean, it's pretty tragic. Tragic's maybe too strong a word. It's, it's pretty outrageous and foolish and frankly pathetic that labor notes is acting like it's March, 2020. And we don't know 
that this disease is not in fact the second coming of the Spanish flu. And they're acting as if these vaccines were like, you know, the smallpox vaccine mm -hmm. or the polio vaccine, which work quite robustly. I mean, right, polio was basically driven to extinction, except in Pakistan, and I think it's come, it's popped up in a few other now for sort of failing states. But it was when the CIA used the uh, the polio eradication program in Pakistan to locate Bin Laden. Bin Laden yeah. Suddenly, that program people were like, "Whoa, stay away from that!" <laughs> and so polio has actually begun to grow again, spread again in Pakistan. But um, you know that vaccine, you didn't need a booster every four months or ever, right? It like wiped the disease out. Yeah. And yeah. that CIA project led to in Middle East since then, basically, you get uh, like I have doctor friends who are, you know, people don't like the same issue they have in California with people not having like vaccines that have been working for like more than 100 years or something like people are now, you know, anti-vax because they are suspicious that all oh, foreign government want to genetically modify us or something. So it, all it does, it helps with, you know, conspiracy theories and that. Yeah. Yeah. And should we stick to COVID here, yeah. I guess, a little bit? Maybe we can come back um, come back to Iraq. But before getting in, into your article, I mean, so you just said, you know, it's like the third year. So in the U.S., I mean, there are still parts like I'm guessing this conference you're talking about has just happened or is it or is so about it's to happen in June? Wow, it's going to happen in June. And there's still right. yeah, I mean, that that really surprises me. I mean, I mean, in Europe, at least it really seems like, you know, since February and March, your decisions have been totally different. I mean, I haven't heard the word, <laughs> the word vaccine yet. I heard it on the radio um, recently, and they were kind of encouraging some people a little bit here and there to get the vaccine. But I mean, they're not demanding it anywhere. But yes, in the US, I guess private companies are still asking some of them. And in some places, the, the left is really the holdouts, you know, I mean, I mean, most of the country is not feeling the way the people who organize the labor notes conference are mm -hmm. my sister-in-law lives in Georgia. And, um, you know, the, the other day she was saying no one has mentioned COVID or vaccines in months and in Georgia. It's like, it's over. They're not even dealing with it mm -hmm. anymore, but in certain parts of the Northeast, certain parts of California, and unfortunately in the organized left and, um, yeah, I mean, we can get into yeah, the, 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 why that might be. Let's see, get into that. Exactly. So do you want to just start by laying out your main argument in the article? Sure. What I argued in the article is that the, well, a critical of the left embrace of COVID, right? And so one thing that's interesting is that, that the response from the indignant left being criticized was that one response was like, this is a straw man. The left didn't do this. Well, the left is still doing it. Thus, the, the labor notes example, if the left did do it and is still doing it, and people are in total denial of, of the emerging science on this stuff. And I think what happened was that the, the pandemic got politicized by the crazy election uh, and, and Trump derangement syndrome. If you go back to 1976, there is a... Uh, there's a, a swine flu outbreak and there's a vaccine whipped up and 20% of the American public take the vaccine, including then president Gerald Ford. And it was only after 20% of the population had been vaccinated that they realized that first of all, the WHO could not confirm any deaths from the swine flu. The one, the one soldier who died in Fort Detrick, it all begins at a US military base in the, in the US when a number of soldiers after uh, some intense training in the extreme heat get sick and one of them dies and tests are done and they think, okay, this could be swine flu. And it's assumed that that, that that fatality was due to swine flu. It's ultimately not clear that even that initial case was a swine flu. So they realize, wait a minute, this, this virus is not killing very many people. And they also discovered that the vaccine was creating autoimmune problems. It was creating the uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, which is can be paralyzing 
and can be fatal uh, or it can be a passing thing. And several hundred people died and thousands, according to a CBS news report later, 60 Minutes report, thousands of people sued the government. And so they stopped the vaccine campaign. And from that point on, you see that every time there's an infectious disease that could be considered a pandemic, the, the forces like the pandemic industrial complex, if you will, which is to say the captured regulatory agencies, the FDA, the Center for Disease, uh, the CDC, um, the NIAID, which is Anthony Fauci's outfit, right? These de departments of the federal government now receive on average about 45% of their funding from user fees, which is money they are paid by big pharma to do research for big pharma. So these agencies simultaneously regulate, they're supposed to do independent research and regulate big pharma. And at the same time, they do fee for service research work for big pharma. And that contributes to the agency's budgets and also to the personal bottom line of scientists. Scientists working for these government agencies are allowed to own patents and they're allowed to make up to $150,000 a year per patent. To be fair, most patents don't earn anything like that. The average patent earns $9,000 a year. So there are all sorts of conflicts of interest. So anyway, this is like these captured agencies and big pharma, they're from the late seventies on trying to gin up hysteria about infectious diseases. The agencies are partly doing this because this is the opening, this is the dawn of the neoliberal era. Austerity is in the air and infectious diseases due to sanitation uh, and vaccination and whatever else, infectious diseases in, the core economies of the global north were, you know, pretty much uh, a minor issue by that point. And so in the face of austerity in the late 70s, where are we going to cut? These agencies were obvious candidates mm -hmm. for having their budgets cut. So they defended themselves by trying to gin up hysteria, i.e. trying to make the case for their importance. And each time they do this, they only get so far and what happens is that the journalistic class, the political class of both parties have enough autonomy that at a certain point they say, you know what, we're not buying it. We're just not as freaked out as you guys are. And we're not going to give you all the goodies you want. And we're not going to do the crazy things you're asking for. Um, so anyway, and so that and you see this pattern again and again and again. And then this time that doesn't happen. You know, I mean, you saw very recently with like Zika and Dengue, there's all these like real, like, oh my God, what's going to happen? And then it's like, partly it's also like the disease doesn't cooperate. Like, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of these viruses mutate towards less and less lethality. So there's like Zika's around and then it's like Zika just kind of mutates into a, a harmless virus. Um, but the Trump reelection campaign had the entire chattering class, right? The vast majority of, of the journalistic class and even a lot of people in, in the Republican party really freaked out in the entire Democratic party ecosphere. And both sides of that election essentially agree in public to politicize this. Uh, the Democrats were like, okay, we finally got Trump. This time he's messed up, you know, Hollywood access tape, this, that, the other thing. They've been saying, we got him, we got him, but this time we really got him. He's gonna mess up how he handles this. He is messing up how he handles this uh, pandemic. And Trump as well was like, okay, they're, the Democrats are embracing the lockdowns. I'm going to embrace the reopening. And so it's like in March, things are a little confused. In the beginning of March, for example, and this is in the article, you have Bill de Blasio, who was then mayor of New York City. A week into March, he's saying, don't worry about it. If you're under 50 and you're in relatively good health, there's really nothing to worry about from this disease. A week later, he's shutting down all the public schools. And it's in late March that, so now the, the point being that like, there, are, there are major Democratic Party politicians who are still um, not fanatical about COVID as late as early March, 2020. You've got before that people like Kamala Harris and 
uh, the vice president now and former governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, both saying, oh, I'm not going to trust the vaccine yeah. that that Trump, Trump. Is behind, right? <laughs> so then in late March, Trump says, we want to open the economy by Easter, the middle of April. And at that point, it's like on. It's like, OK, this is the fight we're going to have. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, right wing foundations, particularly found a foundation connected to the DeVos family out of Michigan starts funding protests at state capitals, because what's going on is that the federal government has limited powers and the, the COVID task force, the white house COVID task force, which has Anthony Fauci and uh, ambassador Deborah Bricks at the heart of it, they're messaging out this fear mongering. And there's, but there's limits to what the federal government is doing or can do, but it's the state governors who are imposing these lockdowns. And so there are protests at state capitals and it's like 35 different state capitals see protests. Some of them involving people with guns, uh, protesters from militia groups like the three percenters, the Oath Keepers, and it's very right wing scene and it's armed. And in, in Michigan, for example, they go after, at least verbally, they go after the, the, the female governor, Gretchen Whitmer, in really kind of disgusting ways. So this really freaks out Democrats and, and liberals in particular. And so that's also in the background, right? So it's like this, you know, late March into early April, then it's just like the pandemic is totally politicized. What's happening at the same time is that new information is coming in. We're getting the first studies about what the infection fatality rate is rather than the case fatality rate, right? The case fatality rate is a function of how widely you test. The, 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 you know, if you, if the more broadly you test, then the, the more cases there are, and thus the fewer fatalities there are. And so the case fatality rate's not the, not the real fatality rate. There needs to be proper population-wide sampling to find out what the actual infection fatality rate is. Iceland is the first country to do this. And they discover that lo and behold, coronavirus is not as lethal as the initial projections that had come out of Imperial College London and were done by Neil Ferguson, the same guy who over-projected the danger of mad cow disease in the mm. 90s and caused Britain to mass to kill and burn most of its cattle herd. Whereas in the U S there were a few cases of mad cow or maybe there were none, I forget, but you know, other places, there were a few little cases that would be shut down at the source. They, they took the, the downer cattle out of the feed. Cause that was, that was all the result of sick cattle being ground up and fed back to other cattle, which is disgusting mm, wow. in itself. Yeah. So this guy had a, had a bad track record, but that didn't matter. He was the one who did the first model saying it could be a two to 3% infection fatality rate. And um, so as this new information is coming in, the, the conditions among the political class and the journalistic class are such that they become totally unwilling to accept this or even examine it because this is now the fight for democracy, the fight for the soul of America. We've got to get rid of Donald Trump. There's also five field hospitals in, in New York, one of them being a, a Navy ship with a thousand, 1100 beds was brought in. All of these field hospitals went relatively unused. There was a major health crisis. A lot of people died in New York. I'm not saying it's not a real disease. It is a real disease. I've had it twice and it killed a lot of people in New York. However, those field hospitals did not fill up. They were hardly used. And so while there, there are these headlines of you know, quote unquote, deplorables in the Midwest, marching on state capitals with American flags and guns. There's also the fact that these field hospitals are all being closed down in New York. And this is just reported on and never discussed, right? And so that was the moment when there could have been a rethink, when people could have been like, whoa, mm -hmm. so the field hospitals have been closed down because they weren't used. What does that mean about this disease? You know, what, what policies should we pursue going forward? What do we know? What don't we know? Those kinds of discussions became totally forbidden, especially on the left. And so that's how this stuff just sort of spins out of control in the US. But mm -hmm. I also mentioned in the article how this crisis has been used 
by every little power center in the world, from street gangs in Latin America to the dean at your local college, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone is like using this as an opportunity to, you know, do whatever they want to do, do more of what they were doing, take power from other people, shirk their responsibilities, et cetera, control others. So my, you know, in other words, my article is, is primarily about the US and thus it's rather American centric. And that doesn't fully explain what's going on, what went on all over the world. And I think what explains the, the overreaction all over the world is you know, different sets of dynamics in each country, but that are rooted in the fact that emergencies are a great opportunity for elites and for institutions and, and power centers of, enter, of ever sort, every sort to gather up more power and try and you know, lock down. And so you saw that again and again throughout the world. So if someone tells you, you know, these were special times, you could easily counter them. Well, maybe there were, there were special times initially, but, you know, information started flowing very quickly. And you can see different countries um, reacting differently. I mean, yeah. where I live in Switzerland, I feel like they dealt with it much more differently. You know, of course, they also had initially lockdowns and things, but things change. And yeah, when you think of Canada, Australia, I guess the Trump dynamic doesn't explain it, but your overall framework that you put explains why yeah. they behave yeah. such a way. Although China, I mean, that one really like <laughs> puzzles Not me. Yeah, yeah, that why they're still yeah, doing diff- I, have a, yeah, I have a little conspiracy theory that perhaps they're thinking like any economic shock or harm that comes from this will harm like other countries more than themselves because they're so planned, but that's just a little okay. <laughs> conspiracy. Yeah. I mean, no, I mean, that could be an element of it. I mean, there's also, I think in China, there's the whole, um, you know, I mean, you, you see this, like, like the, the logic of, of um, we should sort of name this logic of, you know, the, of the, of the mid crisis power grab, let's call it that. Right. You see that, in effect, because mm-hmm. it's like the provincial governors, the mayors, but then it's also like down to like local cops, like, <laughs> you know, no one on high told some of these cops in Shanghai, who you can see videos of them, like clubbing bags of cats. Right. I mean, that's like, that doesn't come from on high. That that's like, that's some volunteer in some police department being like, I want you guys to go out there and get the pets. And like, you know, we're going to show those above us in the mm-hmm. hierarchy that we take this seriously and no one's going to mess with us. Right. And then like, so it's like there's a lot of um, a lot of volunteer enthusiasm involved in this too, and it's like that same logic of like now is my time to shine. This little village I live in in Western Mass, we saw this with our local health board. I mean, these people just start throwing their weight around. They're like, I think they're like <laughs> volunteer too. I don't know they're they're suddenly like just tell you know just just making rules and posting them, and people are like, whoa, uh, based on what and who are you exactly? What are you talking about? <laughs> And these are, uh, you, can tell, you can tell these people were like actually like elated, kind of high on their power. Here they are basically doing nothing for years and years. And then suddenly they're at the center of this mm-hmm. global drama and it's all in them. And like, we're going to make signs and we're going to impose rules. And it's like, you know, it was exciting. Right. Felt like <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's these, they are the same people who show up at your house when you're having a party and try to, help out with organizing it maybe putting the chairs there they basically have a power fantasy that they just want to yeah yeah Yeah. they just want to do so sam i don't know if you had any questions but i feel like this one paragraph i was actually going to read because about policy making i think it goes really well with with our conversation with what we're talking about right now so unless you had go ahead yeah i just want to say don't you find it very weird that the most compelling argument for the lockdown for me was that the health system maybe does not have enough spaces in hospitals that you mentioned. So maybe we shouldn't put so much pressure because suddenly infection mm-hmm. rate will go up. But then I saw no, none of the left so-called like outlets. Nobody was arguing for more investment by government in health. Uh, like, in, like, so we have more health infrastructure. So next time it, we don't have fewer ventilators but everybody was telling all the weak people and all the workers and all the people who basically depend on the wa- daily wage to stay home I-, I just found that from the left very weird i don't know like that nobody yeah. was talking about infrastructure yeah yeah i mean i think people would they would mention it 
but they didn't campaign around it. The, the majority of what they campaigned around was like getting you to wear a mask and um, wash your hands endlessly and get vaccinated and get boosted and, and excluding people who aren't vaccinated and attacking in quite hysterical and deranged ways, anyone who dissented. So, yeah, I mean, they would all, they would all defend themselves. Say, well, no, we've always been into, you know, we've always been for Medicare for all, et cetera, et cetera. And, and they, you know, they were technically, but just, it wasn't, it, there was no huge campaign around it, right? It wasn't like all the groups that were working on that came together, you know, that would have involved possibly getting together in real life and stuff like that. <laughs> that, that, that <laughs> It's too yeah. difficult. No. <laughs> it's very sad. It's re it's really it's really weird. It's um, I think it was also for the left that it was uh something for fear of the future to cathect upon. You know, people are concerned about climate change. That I mean, people are particularly on the left, but throughout this society, and I think throughout many societies, are acutely aware that this system, global capitalism, is really out of control, that there really isn't any adult supervision, that the most powerful people on the planet are evil and self-serving, but also actually sometimes just really dumb mm. uh, and, and not, not up to the task. And that's a tremendous kind of anxiety to live with, to realize how out of control things are. And so I think a lot of this like tension and, and anxiety just like latched on to COVID. And so it was like, this was where people were gonna pour all that energy. Now they had something they could do as opposed to just sitting and waiting. It reminds me of, uh, I think it was in Sebastian Younger's book called War. He had a whole very interesting discussion of PTSD and and how the, the research shows that people, at least among American soldiers, that, well, the, the famous study was actually, it was about navigators and pilots, Navy navigators and Navy pilots. And Navy navigators in these, these that would fly on and off aircraft carriers where there's a navigator sitting behind the pilot, that the navigators have much higher levels of PTSD because there's, they spend a lot of their time unable to do anything. They have mm -hmm. no control. They're just sitting there hoping that the pilot lands on this, you know, coffin sized deck in some rough, rough seas. And the pilots have control and whether or not, you know, they really know what they're doing, at least they feel they have control. And so I think there's, I mean, there's a lot of that. Like people just really feel that they have no control and no power. And so COVID opened a way for them to have control and have power. And, and that is really rewarding, especially if you're coming from a situation of just not having any power. And so when it comes to policymaking at the higher level, I mean, I found this um, few sentence from yours very interesting. So how policies are made. So you wrote, I am not charging conspiracy or mass fraud, although there have been a number of indictments. Rather, I'm suggesting that the policies described above arrived in uncoordinated and ad hoc fashion by different branches of government during a confusing moment of emergency. So, I mean, yeah, how do you think kind of these policies are, are made during these times? I mean, yeah. if you can so what that, that. that that referred to how there was an overcount. So one of the things I argue, this is a long essay for those who are listening, oh, yeah. if you haven't read it, it's like got 120 footnotes, about 8,000, 10,000 words, I think. It's really good though. Thank you. It's fun. Yes. probably take more than one sitting. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> so I, I argue that I don't think a million people did die of COVID in the U.S. And that will strike many leftists as total sacrilege. And I mean, you know, I hope this doesn't get taken down by YouTube. It probably will. Who knows? But here's what happened. Here's how there was an overcount. It was not, as, as the quote says, it's not, it's not that there was a conspiracy. These lockdowns are happening by state governors. The state governors are locking these down and they're expecting waves of COVID casualties to overwhelm the healthcare system. And so they very rationally in almost all of these, I think every single one of these state lockdowns except North Dakota said to hospitals, you have to stop all elective procedures. And that's where hospitals in this country make their money. Mm. And a lot of things are elective, you know, things that are necessary. Elective procedures aren't just like plastic surgery to make you look better. It's also 
teeth? Like a lot of non-emergency stuff, like, like, uh, you know, hip replacements that you desperately need, but you could go another couple months with, you know, in pain without the hip replacement, that kind of thing. That's the classic sort of elective surgery. So these hospitals stop all their elective surgery. They start going into financial meltdown. And then at the same time, the CARES Act comes along and says, we're going you know, to create a fund called the Providers Relief Fund, which ultimately has $178 billion put in it. That's, that's you know, basically a quarter of what the US military budget was that year. Um, and this money is available to cover all COVID related expenses. And they, at first, a COVID case has to have a positive in vitro diagnostic di diagnosis. They remove that. And, and pretty quickly, it's like, look, if a doctor thinks it's COVID, it's COVID and we'll pay you quickly and we'll pay you 120% of the standard Medicare allotment. The vast majority of the people going in are, are older too. So that matters a lot because mostly they're all covered by Medicare, but that's just the baseline for all uninsured um, people and people with public insurance. Um, so these two things, right? creating a crisis for the healthcare industry. And, and just to be clear, by the end of April, 2020, a million point four healthcare workers had been fired because of the financial crisis happening in hospitals. So that's what ending elective surgery, sorry, procedures meant in these hospitals. I first found out about this talking to a friend of mine who at that time worked for SEIU in Michigan. And I asked him how, you know, how are, and it was SEIU is a healthcare union, and he he worked uh, with health in in hospitals in Michigan, and he said in in Detroit we're struggling to get enough personal protective equipment for our members. There's like heavy duty COVID wave, but in Western and Northern Michigan there are numerous hospitals that are totally empty at night. Mm. They have no patients whatsoever in them. And they're going into financial crisis. This was in early April. And I remember just thinking that that's crazy. How could that be? Lo and behold, it was, he was totally correct. And by the end of the month, a million point four healthcare workers had lost their jobs because of the financial crisis that the lockdowns caused for hospitals. At the same time, the CARES Act through the Providers Relief Fund is pushing money out the door. Uh, that Alex Azar, the head of uh, health and human services said, look, our goal is to get this health care provider relief fund, the provider relief fund money out the door as quickly as possible. Right. So there wasn't a conspiracy to juke the stats and cook it up. There were a bunch of political actors moving in an uncoordinated fashion, all responding to the hype that they're reading in the press, which is all a response to uh, uh, Fauci and Deborah Bricks carrying forth, which is itself the result of Trump being totally incompetent to some extent, because he didn't even like these people, but he didn't have his acts together enough to just fire them. So anyway, so that's, so that's how you get in this situation where there was uh, an incentive built in, which is that you will get 120% of your usual costs and you'll get them quickly if you can classify this case as a COVID case. And so a lot of hospitals did that. And I recently, a friend of mine, his sister works for the president of a major hospital in Pittsburgh. And she said, oh yeah, that's absolutely the case. I was there in the meetings. She would not talk to me on or off the record. She was too afraid, but I mean, I don't think that's that weird. What If you were a hospital administrator and the governor told you to stop elective services and you see this staff that you care for and have worked with for years being laid off. And then at the same time, the government is saying, hey, if you can call stuff COVID, we'll give you money for it. What are you gonna do? Like not be like, be like no, well, I, I'm not sure it really is COVID. No, you're gonna try and get as many positive COVID tests. And remember, they changed the rules so they didn't have to be a PCR test. The PCR test is also flawed. It just had to be diagnosis. Be like, you know, if you feel, you know, if, if a patient expresses, describes some symptoms that could be COVID, then a doctor 
is free to say, I think it's COVID. I think your, your, the costs of your case are going to be covered under COVID. And if you're the hospital manager, what are you going to go around and be like, now, are you sure all these cases are really yeah. COVID? You're going to be like, that's great. You know, every one of these cases that's paid for is one less person who might even be a friend that I have to fire. Right. So it's not a conspiracy. It makes perfect sense why there would be an overcount in the u.s so just double incentive really for the hospitals in those yeah in those cases really yeah sam did you want to say something then then these numbers then feed back into the press and the whole moral panic that and the headlines and so then the the, you know the the lawmakers and everyone are reading these yeah headlines and reacting accordingly which then generates more fear-mongering headlines and people didn't question it too much. I mean, I think Kim Iverson gives this example. You know, typically back in the day when you go to a doctor and they would say something, you'd want, you know, second or third opinion, especially when it's for something, you know, major, like a knee surgery or something. But I guess being sick with COVID on that, people would just take whatever is being said right there and move on in a sense. Yeah, made all the easier by the fact that the CDC was recommending that you do nothing, mm. right? It's not, you know, of course, people would be demanding second and third opinions if if the if the recommendation was like that you yeah. amputate both your hands or something right then people are like whoa wait a minute but it's just like yeah you've got covid and um and the prescription is drink a lot of water and come back come back when you can't breathe and we'll put you on ventilation and that was literally what it was for the first year in this country yeah so, i mean i just have this one comment and with all everything that you said it completely you know destroys what i said but sometimes i just felt like the responses to covid by the government were some of the better genuine ones relative to other things although it's really hard to compare but you know sometimes you take like there's a conflict zone for example and you know that sending more guns is going to make the situation worse you know it's happened over and over again and they will do that or for instance there's 20 uh, 2018 there's a financial crisis and all this if you're thinking of helping people it makes no sense to implement austerity measures and you know this is i think nothing that they needed new data or like even wait a month for it to come out there's things that have been studied and looked at a lot so i mean just covid sometimes i would think like <laughs> this is like the best that governments at time perhaps uh, respond in a way although there's all these things well, that are wrong with it yeah th- but there were elements of the response that were really good. Mm. For example, much in the CARES Act, including this public aid for hospitals. We don't want our already threadbare healthcare system to lose more hospitals. New York State in the last 20 years, I think it had lost, or last 10 years has lost like 20% of its ICU beds, right? So the profit motive in American healthcare means that the, the system is cut to the bone so that it's operating at maximum efficiency. You don't want redundancy. You don't want excess capacity because that's just investment that's not earning a return. So certainly like defending the healthcare system with public money, that makes perfect sense. There were other good things too, like from the CARES Act, giving people stimulus checks, increasing mm-hmm. the amount of money paid in unemployment and the duration uh, that it would be paid. All of that was very good. And it actually led to an increase in personal savings. Personal savings went up 8%. There was, um, there'd been a a kind of a dearth of startups for the last 15 years. People Mm -hmm. started starting new businesses. So there were some very good policies that also happened during COVID. I would not want to say that it was all bad. And um, yeah, so- No, definitely. Particularly like giving money to people, helping people out in need was 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 good for those people and it was it was part of what helped create this like you know rapid rebound in economic activity so it also worked at a macroeconomic level no that's one good thing that we saw and i was thinking is it perhaps because we just came out of this big phase of austerity you know austerity seems to be a bit less in you know fashion i feel than it was like three four five years ago so i mean Thankfully, since maybe governments had experienced that, they didn't want to, you know, double down with kind of austerity measures on top of that. Yep. Um, and now, now state budgets in this country are actually quite flush for the moment. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the federal government's debt went way up. And mm-hmm. we have a deeper problem in this country, which is that 
a lot of a lot of companies are not healthy and are dependent on selling bonds, selling their own debt into markets that private markets that are increasingly propped up by the Federal Reserve going in and buying this corporate debt. The classic example is J.C. Penney, an old retailer. It's it's a it's considered a zombie firm, and that that it just you know there's there's no way it can ever pay its debts. It's basically walking dead. And the business model seems to be that J.C. Penney's issues debt, sells bonds into the private market, and uses the proceeds to pay its managers and then also to service previous bonds. And so the Federal Reserve has been facilitating this, enabling this by going in, quantitative easing will involve the Federal Reserve going into markets and buying up assets, buying mm -hmm. the, um, the assets of companies, the bonds of companies that in many cases just would not be able to stand on their own two feet if they weren't selling debt that was being purchased by the federal government. So not all of the debt generated by the federal government was wisely spent. And U.S. capitalism has, as Robert Brenner put it, you know, a bailout problem. There is a kind of a weird de facto, a creeping de facto nationalization of investment. I mean, keep in mind, of course, that investment is also there's there's massive underinvestment in the real economy and overinvestment in financial assets that part of what neoliberalism has brought and all the deregulation and privatization that's gone with it and offshoring is that there's, there's not enough investment in the real economy and there's too much investment in the financial <laughs> sector, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the financialization of American capitalism. And, um, and that's part of what helps explain this sort of bottlenecks and the supply chain problems. So. So the downside is that that you know the federal government not only was subsidizing people who deserved and need help, but also a very distorted and dependent kind of financialized American capitalism, uh, a version of American capitalism that that is not investing at the rate that it should. So that money just investing goes in the real to economy. The... That is, so. yeah. No, Sam, I don't know if you had um, some questions. Otherwise, I know we didn't touch on the vaccine study aspect. I think that would be also interesting if, to talk about. No, but. Just because we just talked about economy right now, I thought maybe we'd jump to what do you think, like it's a two part, basically, what do you think are the long term economic effects? Because we did have the lockdowns that happened already. We can't just stop that. So, you know, what do you think are the economic effects of having these lockdowns and the supply chains? Do you think long term it's going to be a big issue or it's like a year or two and they're going to be fine? And what do you think is the effects of this whole like, you know, lockdown left and others being so censored, you know, being so fanatical, as you say? So, you know, what do you think is the long term effect of that sort of process? Well, in terms of the the economy, I I, I hesitate to say, but I think, I think we're in for a fairly long period of inflation because some of this inflation is caused by these bottlenecks, and these bottlenecks are caused by decades of underinvestment. That companies are, you know, preferring to buy back their own stock and and you know give money to stockholders rather than invest in infrastructure. An example would be that one of the major diesel refineries on the East Coast caught fire several years ago in Philadelphia. And the company hasn't rebuilt it yet. <laughs> and one can assume that they've made calculations, it's Phillips 76, that they made calculations about the stock price and using what money they have available to do other things with it, as opposed to you know, invest it in rebuilding this diesel plant and this conditions were like, well, what? What's going to happen with the Green New Deal anyway? Maybe there'll be some more subsidies if we, you know, they don't know what's going on. You can imagine all the reasons, but they haven't rebuilt this, this important diesel refinery. And that's part of why diesel is reaching $7 a gallon. Hmm. And when diesel reaches $7 a gallon, that means everything else starts getting really expensive. So Transportation. Those, that's just one example of, a, of a, a systemic problem of underinvestment. That problem is not going to be solved by the Federal Reserve raising interest rates. 
And so the, the Federal Reserve, to some extent, is fighting the last war. They're doing what Volcker did in the uh, in 79 and, and through 81, which was he he tried to smash inflation, which was at that point much more driven by an empowered working class bidding up wages and um you know, wages are rising now, but but they're not keeping pace with inflation. And that, I mean, the, the, the main driving cause of inflation is not workers bidding up wages to the point that there's a wage price spiral. But that's what the Fed is sort of locked into. And so they're going to like try and bring down prices by smashing the working class. And I don't think it's going to work. It's going to be bad for the working class. But I also I don't think it's going to bring down prices because part of what needs to happen is there has to be a lot more investment. And that's not always immediately as profitable. It's also just not as profitable as, as speculating during a bull market. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think there's going to be, it's going to be difficult period in terms of, um, um, in terms of the other part of the question, like where, where's the lockdown left on all this sort of stuff? And censorship, Going I think Sam it. was also yeah, yeah. again highlighted, kind of. Do you, like basically, do you think this is like a momentary fanaticism, or are they like this is now going to be the default thing that words hurt, and we have to be very careful about what we say? And I think I think this is not a momentary thing. I think this is um, this is going to be with us for a while. It's rooted to some extent. It's rooted in, in the defeat of social movements coming out of the the sixties and seventies and the retreat of many leftists into the academy and simultaneously the academy, which is always described as a hotbed of leftism is actually not. The academy had, has been thoroughly cleaned up through anti-communism. There are, there are, you know, there are Marxists here and there you can find, you know, you can find a Marxist on every campus pretty much. But a lot of what happened from the 1950s to the present is that, and this relates to stuff we talked about last time we all had a conversation, right? That there was like foundation support for identity politics and uh, developing grievances of all sorts, except those that hinge on the question of class exploitation. Right. They may be very adjacent to it. They may overlap, but it's all about like all these other issues. And I'm not saying these other issues are not real and not important. They are real and they are important, but they do not all automatically add up to a class analysis and a class struggle. That is its own thing. And that has to be done also. So people who are making those kinds of arguments are systematically driven out of academia. My father, for example, who was red baited out of academia. And at the same time, there's this whole discourse. And crucial to this is post-structuralism and post-modernism, this you know, trendy French theory, which was all the rage when I was an undergraduate and a graduate in the, the 90s, basically. And, um, and so post-structuralism, and I, I, I don't want to come across as too hostile, probably compared to a lot of my friends or a lot of comrades, I'm much more sympathetic to Foucault, at least, mm -hmm. than a lot of people would be. I, I, see, I see a lot of use in a lot of what he wrote. Though he was also, certainly by the end, you read these lectures from 1978, 79, I mean, he's, he's very explicitly into neoliberalism. So I, I'm not down with that stuff. Um, Foucault loved the Iranian Revolution too, which turned out to be quite reactionary in the end. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, on campuses, there are a lot of lefties who, you know, all these non-material thing of left, you know, they're they're very concerned with and as far as left as you can get with those things, but right. in some other so, areas. So a lot of this, tra this concern with language traces back to that, you know, French post-structuralism, right? I remember distinctly the first time I encountered people who were so serious about words mm. that there were violence and this and that and it's like you know what are you sure what i kind of thought well isn't this just sort of semantics i mean it's like it doesn't matter what you call it like let, let's deal with reality but it was like dressed up with all this like you know high-end theory and these cool books with these like you know kind of matte black covers and 
you know, you're like French wow, names. <laughs> yeah. French names and like this huge idea of throwing out truth. There was a lot, a lot of that, that was pretty interesting, but, um, but you know, that's what that has, that has now like spread out into the whole society. And so, you know, people who work in HR department and people who are like, whatever people who are like, you know, pushing paper at Netflix have a little bit of the English department from their elite school in their head. And they're like, they think that like language and representation is everything. And that like material reality is downstream from, from language and representation and everybody's mm -hmm. a little philosopher. And so I think that's, that's also a big part of what creates the subculture of the left that's into censorship. And I think that's how I increasingly feel about the left, you know, because I'm critical of the left, people sort of ask me, why are you even on the left? What does that mean? I'm on the left because of the traditional left agenda of equality and economic redistribution and democracy. And what the left in the US suffers from is, is that it has become a subculture. Too much of it has become a subculture that's about obsessed with representation and care and performance and micropolitics, all that stuff traces back to post-structuralism. You wouldn't want to reduce it to post-structuralism, but that's a huge part of it. And that's the kind of ersatz decoy left that fills in the vacuum that's left as actual Marxists and socialists, leftists are driven out of the academy. People who want to talk about political economy, people who want to mm -hmm. talk about exploitation, they're removed. And instead you have new professors who talk about oppression and representation. Right. When oppression and exploitation are very similar and they often overlap, but they're not the same thing. Right. Economic exploitation is about who produces value and who extracts and claims and owns that value. And that that process often involves oppression, but it's not the same thing as oppression. There's, there's oppression everywhere. So that shift from exploitation to the question of oppression But do you think they is, can is, is deep, it's not a trend it's not going away that's the in answer to your question sorry go on. E, e, even if the living standards are going down there is a high inflation and people start actually experiencing like hunger and violence do you think they can still continue with this like nonsense kind of? well that might change things you know yeah i mean hopefully you're right who knows but we shall see right maybe we'll look back on this and we'll say oh, well that that really was part of the bubble. We'll be like, well, that, that, that bubble moment was like you had crypto was huge, NFTs were huge, and Elon um, Musk. Yeah, Elon <laughs> Musk and 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 a, and a violent obsession with pronouns and canceling people were also part of that bubble culture. Like obviously, like that's what people get into when they're not worried about paying the rent. Maybe as economic hardship kicks back in, people will not forget all the nonsense, but, you know, put it, put it to the passenger seat and kind of like be willing to come together with other people around questions like, yeah, let's actually get these student debts canceled. Let's get wages up. Let's get some price controls. Um, the, uh, the, who was it? it was uh, Dean Baker's group did a report on inflation and they, they estimate that like 50% of inflation is driven by of this inflation is driven by price gouging too, right? Mm -hmm. So like, let's like let's take on the price gouging. Let's hope. I don't know. Mm. I'm usually wrong about predicting the future. So. <laughs> yeah, that's not, that's not an easy <laughs> thing to do. Um, that's for sure. So I just went to one last thing because you did so much amazing research really for this article. So on the COVID, my last question on the, on the COVID part, which is, so what did your research show about the kind of studies that were done or the research that you did for your article on the studies that were done on the vaccines? What did you find there? And some of the examples are shocking. I really recommend everybody checking them out, like really shocking, like examples of corruption and uh, misuse of science, I guess. I don't know. Well, um, I wrote, I relied on, uh, um, the, the the BMJ, formerly the British Medical Journal, mm -hmm. and um, this one guy, Peter Doshi, I think was his name, who's yeah. a professor of 
You've got it right there. I'm not my man. Yes, I'm a formerly British known associate. Yes, Peter Doshi, a senior editor at the BMG. Yeah. And he's a, he's a professor of pharmacology in, in Maryland. And so he, he looked at what was available from the Pfizer study. And I mean, one of the shocking things he found was that they, that the, so there's, first of all, there's two groups. There's the, the vaccine arm and the placebo arm. There's 20, roughly 22,000 people in each arm. And the study went on for several months before emergency youth authorization was granted. But lo and behold, after about two months, by, by, by the end of two months, it seems that the majority of people in the placebo arm who wished to get the vaccine had taken the vaccine. Mm -hmm. So the, the study was unblinded within two months. The, they also stripped out um, hundreds of people for violating protocols. So that's normal, you know. Yeah. But, but sorry, that's insane. So these people went and got the vaccine themselves or or do you know, like how did they switch from placebo to, to it vaccine was, rooms? They were allowed the um, the sites where they were doing these studies. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the details of how it was communicated, but mm -hmm. but where it came down that that at a certain point, if people if people are in the placebo group and they want the vaccine you can let them get the vaccine so it's like people were told that they were in the placebo group yeah and and they were allowed to get the vaccine so the wow. whole trial you know the actual blinded study is is over within two months they they strip out several hundred people from the uh from both groups but what's disturbing because okay that's normal right if people violate the protocol then mm -hmm. get them out but what's disturbing is that it was something like 360 were removed from the vaccine arm or uh, yeah, from the vaccine arm and only 60 from the placebo arm. So it, it certainly looks like there was more uh, careful sort of tending of what the statistical outcomes would be in terms of the vaccine arm because so many people were removed. And I mean, what, what it suggests very directly is that people who were having adverse events adverse reactions to the vaccine were, were removed oh. so that the numbers for the vaccine would look better. Be that as it may, in the end, the all-cause mortality, which is the key measure of such a study, was higher for the vaccine group than it was for the placebo group. 15 people had died in the vaccine group and 14 people had died in the placebo group. So, that's insane. I mean, this is all, that <laughs> part of the article is that is super, what, yeah? No, that's insane. Exactly. That's, I couldn't believe that. How, yeah. Like, I... <laughs> yeah. And now since then, it receives very little publicity other than Kim Iverson, God bless her for doing this. <laughs> um, 30, I think it was about 30 scientists sued the FDA to get all of the data that Pfizer had submitted to the FDA for its emergency youth author authorization. The FDA said, no, we're not going to release it. The judge said, you have to release it. The FDA said, okay, we need 75 years. Actually, I think it was 50 years. We'll release it in like, you know, 2076. And the judge said, and then the, the plaintiffs came back and they said, well, no, why don't you just, why don't you, why don't you take 108 days to release it? Because that's how long you took to review the documentation given to you by Pfizer before you granted emergency youth mm -hmm. authorization and um, Pfizer got involved. And so anyway, long story short, a judge has ordered that that the FDA release everything that Pfizer submitted. And there have been two big batches of this. And we're already finding out, you know, that they knew natural immunity was stronger, that there were more adverse events that they let on, mm -hmm. that they were, you know, worse than they, than they thought. So. So Sam, I think you had a, you want to ask one more question on the COVID article. If not, we can move on to our other articles. Yeah, just, We've already taken uh, quite a bit of your time question. Yeah, Sorry about that. The, yeah. The last question about COVID was that in an interview, you said the only thing that you wished maybe you included in your uh, article was uh, like how COVID lockdowns are shadowing China or something along those lines, if I'm not mistaken. So, or you didn't look into the ads of the, like the 
Oh, like about sort of like the, so, the way the way that China influenced um, Europe so. and the U.S. Yeah, I mean, there's. I mean, China begins these lockdowns, then Italy, and then only then it comes to the U.S. and other countries. And and at that point, it was just sort of assumed like, oh, well, this is what you do. You do these lockdowns and. Um, and it wasn't properly studied. I think what you're referring to, I, you know, I maybe, yeah, the, 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 the influence of the, of the Chinese example on the West was, is something that could be, could be looked into and thought about. Um, but Lockdowns are new, right? Like they, they haven't been done in the past. I mean, those examples that you gave about the swine flu and all this, they didn't think of doing kind of lockdowns with those diseases there out there. I mean, there are on occasion, not broad lockdowns, but when there are really bad influenza mm -hmm. outbreaks in the U.S., sometimes school will be suspended. But influenza tends to affect young people pretty badly. So there, sometimes there are public health measures like that, but nothing as severe as these lockdowns was ever tried. And, and, and also with these vaccine mandates, you know, mm -hmm. um, one talking point everybody brings up it is the case that made vaccine requirements legal, which is called Jacobson versus Massachusetts. And it's from 1905. And there was a Swedish immigrant named Jacobson who did not want to get the smallpox vaccine because he'd already had it and he had adverse reaction. Or so I forget what it was, but, and, and, and the, it went all the way to the Supreme court and the Supreme court said, no, you have to get the, the vaccine. It's legal for States to mandate vaccines. However, Jacobson is also pretty clear that the, the punishment for not complying can't be too extreme. And so the punishment that Massachusetts was going to impose on Jacobson was like the equivalent of, I, I crunched the numbers on inflation, I forget what it was, but it's something like the equivalent of maybe like $500, it might even been less than that. You know, there's a couple hundred dollars in today's money is what you'd have to pay if you didn't get the vaccine. It wasn't you lose your job. You can't enter public accommodations. I mean, this level of repression around these mandates is totally unprecedented. And everyone, particularly on the lockdown left, like, well, Jacobson says and it's like, actually, if you read Jacobson, it's it does not say you can destroy people's lives if they refuse this vaccine. What it says is like you can you can impose reasonable inconveniences on them, fines. I think the fine was like $5 or $25 in 1905, right? It's like, yeah. that doesn't compare to being fired from your job. And even if, even if, accommodations. even if Jameson did say that, I don't think <laughs> we should necessarily, whatever Jameson said. <laughs> Jacobson, yeah. And also, Jacobson, sorry. yeah, this is also, you know, this is a case that was then used to um, justify forced sterilization and all sorts of eugenics, right? I mean, so there's some pretty universally reviled policies were justified by the finding in Jacobson as well. Yeah, and, and I mean, with the mandates, it became quite clear. I mean, even before the mandate discussions we seem to have picked up, they were already coming out and saying, okay, the vaccines could potentially be helping, you know, to reduce death rates, but it's not stopping the spread. I mean, that became known a few months after maybe five or six months that they were widely being pursued and it was just then when these kind of mandate conversations really seemed to have picked yeah. up at least from a far in the u.s which yeah i, I wish really i had I, I i cited the interview from august 5th 2021 in which the head of the cdc rochelle walinsky says to wolf blitzer of cnn that the vaccines are great in prevent for preventing hospitalization but mm -hmm. they don't stop transmission I should have quoted the whole thing, but I just cited it. But yeah, um, you're absolutely right. And to this day, lots of people on the left act like vaccines do stop transmission. Yeah. I mean, for me, if they actually did, then okay, we can have a conversation. But I mean, right. And that, also, I, the, I mean, I think the two things about severity of the disease and efficacy of the vaccine mm -hmm. are two sides of the same coin, right? If the disease was really, really dangerous, and the vaccine really worked, then it's like, well, we're dealing with a totally different situation yeah, than this one, where it's like, the disease is dangerous. I'm not trying to minimize it, 
but it's not what they initially mm-hmm. thought it was going to be. And the vaccines Especially- don't work. So we're going to shut down society. We're going to crash the economy. We're going to systematically go around and divide the working class and create a new, a new category of second-class citizens who are unvaccinated. We're going to get trade unions to go out of their way to bully their members rather than pick fights with the bosses during the tightest labor market in 40 years. That's what resulted in all this. It's, it's deranged. Well, certainly. Sam, I don't know if you had any other COVID points or if you, Christian, want to add anything else about COVID. But if not, if you have a little bit of time left, we can just go through. Well, I, I just to... encourage people to read the article. It's a long article. I, I mean, that's like, I worked very hard on it. It's not, it's not just like opinions. It's like pretty no, much no. every assertion yeah. is backed Fully up. Reference. So please read it. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, it's not just long like an Atlantic article for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> But, but uh, I'll, ahead, I'll so. save my literature question for the end if you have time. Go ahead okay. with the Iraq sure. and then. Oh, yeah. I mean Iraq. I was going to put aside because I felt like that might take too much time. I don't know. Oh, all I mean, right. Unless, Sorry, unless I thought... you wanted to talk about Iraq. Okay, well, up to you. We unless you want to touch Iraq. a little bit on it, on it, Christian. I don't know. I mean, just so you were a journalist during that time, if I'm not mistaken, right? And you went to Iraq. So maybe just talk about your time a little bit there and looking back. Also, what are some of the main things that come to your mind? I don't know if you followed, but there was election as well. If you had comments or anything, they just had election and all that. Oh, so it's Lebanon. Sorry, I'm mixing up places. <laughs> I'm mi- Sorry, that was Lebanon. <laughs> Shit. Yeah, oh, I God. was. I had a tough day. That's all right. Um, yeah, I was a journalist in Iraq and Afghanistan, oh. and um, um, and I went because. I mean, I had, I had done some conflict reporting. I think I discussed this with you guys last time in El Salvador yeah, when I was younger and stuff like that. And during the war, there was this, this, you know, like it was impossible to critique that war at first mm-hmm. amidst the war hysteria. And there was a real premium put on experience it was classic war fever and there was a lot of macho stuff like well i went and i saw it and a lot of journalists were like well if you didn't go if you haven't been there yeah. you know you can't it doesn't matter what history you've read and i remember saying well i'm not going to be locked out of this conversation <laughs> no one's going to say well you didn't go you don't know i was like so i'm going to go you know and um I and see. so when i was there i i did stories about the reconstruction, the racket of reconstruction, the vast amounts of money that were being stolen from Iraqi public, I mean, Iraqi public money that was seized by the U.S. and just stolen by contractors, and enormous billions of dollars of U.S. tax money as well. We're talking billions of dollars of U.S. of, of Iraqi oil money and billions of dollars of U.S. tax money just stolen by U.S. contractors and um, I mean, there was literally, there was a billion dollars, not a story I broke, this is just mm-hmm. an example of like yeah. a crazy story. There was a, a C-130 full of cash was flown into Kurdistan and it had a billion dollars in like, I don't know, various dollars, Deutsche Marks, I forget what the money was. And they basically Jesus. offloaded these pallets of money to the, um, to the Kurdish forces up there and like got a receipt, got like a handwritten receipt. We have no idea what happened to that money, you know, just stuff like that again and again. And the journalists, the kind of, un, you know, the, the sort of low budget lefty journalists who were there until things got really, really violent and became too expensive and impossible to work there. Um, the kinds of things we would do is just go and look at projects that would be reported that, you know, this or that water treatment facility had been rehabilitated and you mm-hmm. could just go there and inevitably it would be like, no, it hadn't been rehabilitated. You know, there was like, they, they'd paint the front gate and then wow. leave, you know, and like this thing still wouldn't work. And I did, um, I did some of the first reporting on the resistance. My, uh, a fixer that I was working with had been in, and I wrote a book about all this called the freedom shadows and hallucinations in occupied Iraq. And the, fixer that I worked with a lot had been forcibly recruited into Saddam's Fedayeen when he was a teenager because he was really good at Taekwondo and he was a good student. And so he was like taken basically. And he was in this, you know, the Fedayeen were like, um, you know, a special forces of sorts. And 
and then he got he got out of it. He got out of it by um, shooting himself in the leg. <laughs> and so, um, but anyway, so we interviewed members of the Iraqi military who had, who were in who were then in the resistance and. Um, but when you were there, and, yeah, yes, exactly. You went there. Sorry, you were just gonna say you went there around 2005 or six. Then, if I'm, I went there. Um, I went there in 2003, 2004, oh, okay. 2005, and 2006. Oh, so from the get go, really? Yeah, and then and I and I went to, I first went to Afghanistan in 2004 or five, and and then went there until I think the last time I went there was 2007. So I, you know, would go for about two months each time and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what I that's what I did, and I wrote mostly for the Nation and a bit for Playboy magazine because they pay very well. Um, kind of oh, not a publication really? to show to your mother or tell, yeah. tell most employers about, but you know, they have famous I journal. They, I don't even know if they still publish, but they really they did have a real chip on their shoulder mm -hmm. um, about not being taken seriously as a you know journalism and literary mag, so they would pay well to get I good see. stories. So, yeah. It's a big sort publication, so still no, it has a big name. Yeah, <laughs> so people recognize it. it it's not peer reviewed, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, Star, I, I was wondering if, when you were there, do you think even then you could see hints or something of something like ISIS emerging with such a brute force, or was it just so such an impossibility? It's such a fragmented yeah. country, or whatever. Yeah, you could. I mean. First of all, um, Saddam started leaning into religion. Um, it was like after the Gulf War, the you know, first U.S. invasion, he starts to make his version of Baathism much more religious. That's when um, you know God is great is put on the Iraqi flag. That wasn't always there. That was like an addition mm -hmm. to that. So. Things were becoming much more religious already, and um, with the defeat, you know that that whole kind of like secular vision of um, of the Ba'ath Party was was dead, and and everyone was retreating into religion. And there was also, you know, the, the beginnings of the civil war were were beginning. Right? I mean, Iraq is majority Shia, ruled by a Sunni minority. Shia activists had been terribly abused by Saddam, jailed in massive numbers, murdered, tortured. And there were, you know, the, the Mahdi army and other Shia militias were taking revenge against the, the Sunni elite who had, had oppressed them. And, and, and the Sunni were, you know, circling the wagons and striking back. There was, there was one, the, the first U.S. invasion of Fallujah there was some cooperation between Shia and Sunni forces against the U.S., but otherwise, it was already from the beginning emerging that you know there was this like sectarian civil mm -hmm. war developing. So yeah, like the Kurds in the north, Sunni versus Shia, everyone versus the U.S., and everyone also sort of trying to play the U.S. Um, for what they could. And this is, the, yes. yeah, so this is like that period exactly before, so it led to kind of ISIS, right? Yeah. I've, I've forgotten yeah, about that, that whole, yeah, that whole in-between part <laughs> between the invasion and then ISIS. And I guess, I'm guessing you saw recently George Bush's gaffe. I mean, I don't know, I think he did it on purpose or I, something. It was I mean, on it's, purpose. It's, it's, um, yeah. yeah. Was it on purpose? <laughs> In contrast, Russian elections are rigged. Political opponents are imprisoned or otherwise eliminated from participating in the electoral process. The result is an absence of checks and balances in Russia and the decision of one man to launch a wholly unjustified and brutal invasion of Iraq. I mean, of Ukraine. <laughs> Iraq, too. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> 75. Uh, <laughs> I, I feel like it's I read so about surreal. it. I didn't see it. It's so he surreal. Did, he did it twice. He did it twice. That's why I think the second time, at least, was for sure on purpose. Like, 
I mean, second time I, he's trying to make a joke, which I think is, I mean, no censorship here, but it was in bad taste, I would say, considering yeah. how many people died. Yeah. Yeah, you know. No, but it's but, surreal. Yeah. But, and now looking back, I mean, is it just forgotten the Iraq war or what do you think has left any impact on U.S. policy and thinking and all that? It is, I think it's largely forgotten. There is, I mean, a lot of people served in Iraq as soldiers and as contractors. So people kind of carry that experience with them, but it's not discussed much. It's not analyzed. So, you know, I don't think many lessons were learned from it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I mean, one thing I, at the time I, I felt that the Iraq invasion was a mistake for, not only it was wrong, but that like the US empire was, was messing up in its own oppressive terms. But I think I have changed my position on that. And, I, and it's like, it seems like, not that it was preconceived as such or planned as such, but that a style of rule through crisis has emerged in the post-Cold War era. And that the US produces failed states. And whether it does that, US foreign policy does that intentionally or unintentionally, the effect is such that it kind of works for the US, mm. you know? And um, yeah, and so I, I, I used to, at first I thought the production of failed states was a problem for US imperialism. And now I think it's a methodology hmm. for US imperialism. And that's very clearly what's going on in the Ukraine. But we don't discuss this stuff much in the US. People are not that interested in history. And there's always some new outrage, some school shooting, some celebrity divorce trial, <laughs> whatever it is that clogs the headlines. And so thinking about Iraq, I mean, it took, it took America, you know, the better part of a decade to get get our collective head around like wait a minute like who's Moqtada Sadr what like what they are these like, yeah you know they're they're all Muslims but they're these two <laughs> like groups groups and they're like that opposed to each other like you know so I mean you're saying now with your new kind of thinking you're thinking that at least for the U.S. elite or part of them when they look back at Iraq they don't see a mistake then perhaps the fact that you know it's kind of failed state well, I mean, if you're a weapons manufacturer, it's not a problem. I mean, there yeah. was a, an infamous call. I forget whether it was Raytheon or Lockheed Martin, something like that. Somebody leaked. It was a call with investors or stockholders. And it was, I think it was around 2014, 2013. And ISIS was, you know, taking a lot of territory in Syria or something like that. And, and the executive was like, well, you know, it's really, it's terrible you know, it's terrible news, but uh, it's great for us, mm -hmm. you know, so. They say that openly now about Ukraine, pretty much. They're like, yeah, it's terrible. Ukrainians are dying, but look at the stuff price. <laughs> it's like, it's, yeah. Yeah. it's so strange. It's very strange. Sorry. It's, no. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's demented. It's terrible. It's, it's cynical. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that, I think probably the neocons would prefer to have functional client states that do exactly as they wish, but uh, that's hard to produce. And so failed states are the next best thing. And inevitably the free market economics, well, the mix of the military strategy, shock and all, and then economic shock therapy doesn't produce contrary to the ideology that does not produce a stable state that's that produces crisis and, mm -hmm. and state collapse and i mean iraq has oil money and enough kind of you know nationalism that you know they keep it they moving have, forward they, a bit they, they, they i mean iraq has has dragged itself out yeah. of the pit of state failure and you know, has, has reconstituted itself as a, as a functioning state. And, um, and it was, it was the Shia who led the way on that. And they did it around the elections. I was, I was there for some of that, which was really interesting. 
the the U.S. provisional authority was saying, well, we're not going to have elections. You know, we're going to just appoint this government. And it was it was in January 2004. And I remember it was just out of the blue. Suddenly there were like hundreds of thousands of rank and file Shia activists and trucks in the streets. Just like I was like, what? Like we're, we were all like, what? What is all this about? Everybody was like, we want elections. We want democracy. And Ali al Sistani, the, the Supreme Ayatollah of, of Iraq, who totally just stays out of politics, he, he came out and he said, we need elections, right? And it was like, when Sistani said, we need elections, it was like, it was go. And everybody mm -hmm. hit the streets. And it was just so clear that like the vast majority of Iraqi people had to have elections. And so the US was like, oh, okay, uh, we will have elections. The Sunni boycotted the elections and then the Shia parties, not that they all got along at all, swept and they controlled the government and they just kind of like, even as there was a civil war and all that, they also you know, took the parliamentary process very seriously. There was a proposed oil law by the US and the Iraqis rejected it and they, you know, um, they didn't exclude foreign ownership, but they did it on terms that were much more favorable to Iraq. And many of the, the firms that got contracts were not American. They were, you know, Italian, Chinese, Norwegian. So um, there was a very, a very sophisticated and, yeah, it's a very sophisticated navigation of that crisis, primarily by the, the Shia parties led to the, you know, compared to what it was, the relative stability of Iraq now. No, certainly. And yeah, and I mean, the last last thing I just want to say about the Iraq war, I mean, one thing that has surprised me, I really did not think this would happen, which is that they've rehabilitated George Bush. I mean, at least seems like in the mainstream media. And I mean, he was seen as such a villain. I never thought that would be possible, but it's already yeah. been a few years where they're very casually doing it as if it's right. Nothing. Well, there you go. That's a, that's a measure of have we learned any lessons? Mm -hmm. No. Right. Now we see George Bush as a funny guy because yeah. he is funny. He comes out, he paints, he paints pictures of pets and of veterans yeah. and hangs out with Ellen DeGeneres. And so exactly. You know. I mean, that Ellen DeGeneres thing was just yeah. insane when I first saw that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Sam, I know you had yeah. that really important question. You had that question. You really <laughs> want to ask. And I have a question I really want to ask. So you can yeah, go first. <laughs> No, or it's just uh, I really liked your use of language in the article, and I really recommend people check it out because it's not just you know informative. I think even if you disagree with the whole thing, it's really fun to read and good. Like there were some parts I wanted to read. Like there was this one: David Cole, the group's legal director, debased himself in the New York Times with a tortured of explaining everything the ACLU has stood for over the last hundred years suddenly did not apply during the season of freak out and overreach. Or uh, this one, uh, many people get the shots only because their jobs and thus physical uh, well-being are threatened. The lockdown left being mostly members of the professional managerial class generally has no idea about such things. I was just wondering, yeah, any, like, who are your influences in writing and stuff? Because there is a, I feel like there is a dry humor and stuff. I don't know, maybe I'm just reading it like that. But, I, and the title is, I feel like the title, the way you put how to, you know, and love, uh, love the lockdowns, that's like a common trope in literature. So I was just wondering if you have any literature influences. Well, on that. I'm, I'm cool. glad to hear that you saw some dry humor in it. I, I, that I love was, it. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you know, to be fair, my father was an influence. I mean, he didn't, he didn't really, he didn't give me much feedback. He couldn't, he was sort of like too, too, I don't know what, but you know, just too much of a, I don't, I don't know what it was, but he, he never really gave me direct feedback um, other than to be hypercritical. But basically I like didn't, I didn't try to learn anything directly from my father, but he would always, you know, you know, encourage simplicity and directness in writing. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's important. But then, I mean, I think it's just all the usual stuff, you know, I mean, Paul or Orwell's politics of the English language is a great essay, even though I don't really like Orwell's writing, like stylistically either necessarily. Um, but um, yeah, 
I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the big influences would be. You know, I mean, I think there's a, a kind of an American, there's an American voice in writing. You could see in Hemingway and Steinbeck um, that when American English is at, at, it's at its best is when it's like blunt and simple and direct. And so that was, that's always been important is to sort of, you know, if to, to realize, you know, I'm an American and this is like my, you know, this is my folk voice. This is like deep in me. I can't, I'm not a Brit. It's like, I, it's not, that's like a different, I love, I love the way British writers write, you know, and it's just, but it's like, it's kind of like, it's their language and we're just borrowing it, you know? Mm. And, um, but the strength is that it's like concrete and simple. I remember when I was a, yeah. a youth going to, going up to Montreal from Vermont and talking with a French Canadian guy in a bar about, about language and, and uh, just being polite and oh, French is so beautiful. And I really love this, the, the Montreal accent. Cause they had this very kind of funny American Americanized, you know, North Americanized accent. It's not very French. I don't know if you guys have heard it. It's like, yeah, no, no. like, this kind of weren't, like a nasal thing. <laughs> and, um, and he returned the comedy. So, oh, but English is a great language too. He said, English is very concrete. It's very material, you know, and, um, and then when I finally, you know, did learn a bit of a romance language, Spanish to some extent, in, that's the real strength in English is that it's like this concrete, simple, direct language. And it also has a very big vocabulary because, you know, waves of invasion, there's always multiple ways to say something. So um, that, you know, recognizing what, what English's limits and strengths are ha has been a kind of guiding principle in, in writing and also like the idea of having sympathy for your readers you know you should always remember that somebody else is going to read this and they've got a lot of other stuff to do and so everything should count so yeah. those are those are sort of principles they're not necessarily influences but um i i thought perry anderson maybe because i thought there were some similarities i don't know if you know him British Marxist yeah. history, yeah. yeah, but it was like, I loved it, so, yeah, it was so direct, as you say, and concrete, like, but yeah. funny, so you don't get bored, so, yeah. yeah. And I mean, in English, it's typically much more concise, I mean, I have French-speaking um, professors right now who tell their students to try to write, like, the English-American way a little bit, which is <laughs> get rid of some of the unnecessary fat, <laughs> really. I also, I, I learned to write, um, writing for radio, I, like many Americans, graduated high school not being very good at writing. And I lived in San Francisco and there was a, uh, some, a journalist, a lefty journalist. I asked him, how did you learn how to write? And he said, oh, I did an internship at KPFA, which is the mm -hmm. community radio station. And they had, they may still have this program, but they had a program then where they would train you to be a radio journalist and in exchange, this was like a, a class that would meet once or twice a week. I forget. It was a pretty serious class for two, two hours in the evening. And in exchange for this, you had to work for them one day a week for free. And, okay. you know, about half the people dropped out and the other half of people generally did one day a week for free or more. And a lot, that's how a lot of, in those days, a lot of NPR people, unfortunately would start that way. Mm. They start out at this left-wing radio station and then go off to this, garbage at NPR but um that was that was very important because in radio you write for the ear you know and that really helps keep things simple no certainly um so okay uh maybe move along to some some of the yeah, final done, questions I'm yeah <laughs> yeah you can I'm glad you got the writing thank you <laughs> yeah it just means a lot <laughs> Um, I like literature. <laughs> so, Christian, I was just telling you also before we started recording about this whole insider changing the Democratic Party from the inside versus a third party debate. I mean, right now on YouTube, I mean, I'm not sure if you know Brianna from Bad Fate or Katie Halper. I mean, they had this uh, politician, this lady who has never been a politician, she's recently getting into it from Vegas and I mean everybody in the comment section then there's this call-in app that people call nowadays and you know talk to podcast hosts I mean everybody it seems at least in this world are so like oh we can't you know it's 
you can't change the Democratic Party from the inside. Look at what the squad has done and all this, you know, third party, even though there isn't really going on anything there either, but that is potentially more fruitful. So, A, have you been f- um, following this? And is do you think this is a conversation that's happening a lot and like leftist in YouTube or on- online, or have you heard in other places as well? I've not been following it that much, but I mean, I can relate to it because we're all feeling it. And it's the perennial question in the US. Mm. Yeah, there's limits. There's limits to what you can do with the Democratic Party. The problem is that third parties don't go anywhere either because the the duopoly of these two parties has everything locked down. So, and generally third parties just split the left or the right. So, you know, it's, I, I, I don't have much hope for a third party either. But certainly the idea of reforming the Democratic Party from the inside seems pretty limited. That doesn't mean the Democratic Party can't be used. That I mean, there are certain towns where it, you know, like San Francisco, um, New York City these days to some extent, where it's just, you know, it's a one party town. So there's a lot of room in primaries and, you know, progressive people can get in. And then the question is, are they going to be progressive or not? And, and ultimately, what's more important than, you know, rejecting or reforming the Democratic Party are movements, because when there are strong social movements that are demanding radical social change, then even pretty conservative politicians can start doing progressive things. Richard Nixon, totally conservative, right? He presides over the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, the Occupational Health and Safety Administration. He experiments with uh, a, a universal basic income. He imposes price controls. He does, he does, he has a number of policies that are by today's standards, very, very left wing. He did that not because he was progressive or because the Republican party had been from the inside made, made more progressive, but rather did these things because the whole society and in fact, the entire world, but the, the, the society in America was, had, you know, was organized, radicalized and mobilized. There were you know, massive wildcat strikes. There was, you know, the, the civil rights movement had, had won all these formal victories and become the black power movement and the native American, you know, the, 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 the like uh, AIM, the American Indian movement had, was, was strong. I mean, all these different communities were organizing and demanding not a kind of flimsy social media era, era identity politics, but, you know, pursuing kind of identity politics, but very often with a you know, very firm and clear class agenda as well. So when, when the whole society is radicalized, organized, thinking clearly and mobilized, then all sorts of politicians start doing progressive things. So that's much more important, right? Um, less, less important is whether you should or shouldn't be in the Democratic Party and whether... Mm-hmm. Whether you know whether it can be reformed or not, I, I still, even though I'm shocked that the squad voted for the forty billion dollars for Ukraine, I wouldn't therefore say, well, there's no reason to ever run for election and you know be in the Democratic Party. At the same time, I think you you, you have to be realistic about the limits of what you're going to do in that party. But you know, and then there's different situations in different states. In Vermont, for example, there is a fairly strong third party, the Progressive Party. They've had the, the lieutenant governorship, right? So there are places where third parties can um, gain more traction. So that's what I would that's what I'd say on that. N- nothing, nothing does the work of or stands in for a big, broad, strong, clear-headed class movement, right? And if you have that, the rest of the stuff tends to fall into place a little bit more. Yeah, which doesn't seem to be much at the national level. I mean, recently there were all these, not all these, a few, a few uh, Amazon warehouses and other places, people unionizing. But one, one Amazon warehouse. Yeah, Yeah. the other one. The other one failed. Two others failed, Mm -hmm. um, but but one 
was victorious in the Amazon warehouses. A bunch of other, according to the, the main organizer of the Amazon labor union, Christian Smalls, he says he's been contacted by people at every single Amazon warehouse. So there's probably going to be more, um, more efforts in the future. Starbucks is organizing, right? And they're, they're winning the union efforts at Starbucks are winning. I think it's like 80 or 90% of their elections. So something's going on, but if you look at the, like the long-term trend of, you know, union density or strike activity, it's like, we're, we're, we're at a real low. So, you know, we're coming from a really, you know, pretty at bottom, yeah. bad baseline. Yeah, the baseline is at the bottom. So, you know, yes, yes, things are improving, but it's a long way to go. But those, but you know, but that's great. I mean, it's like, it's really nice. fantastic that 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 Starbucks <laughs> workers and Amazon workers are organizing. You know, yeah, and um, and the person leading it, Christian Small. I mean, I heard him um, speak on Fox News, and he could really handle himself. I don't know if you've seen him. Did you see Inter him the Tucker Carlson? Yes, interview? exactly. I mean, I he was so wise, not falling into his traps, yeah. but saying, "Yeah." He, uh, did you guys see him on Lindsey with Lindsey Graham? No, I no. think in the Senate, that one was really good too. He really puts him in his place. He basically kind of says, "Maybe you should be a st start being afraid of workers." You know, maybe you should just start paying attention to what workers say. But he says it's much better. So it really puts Lindsey <laughs> Graham in his place. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the way he dealt with Tucker Carlson was fantastic. It was amazing. Tucker Carlson asked him, like, so AOC didn't come out. And he said, <laughs> like, he's like, it wasn't just her, it was all of them. Just like, exactly. You know, and then he brought the it all of the Democrats. Exactly. Brought it right to their issues and their demands. That was that was really impressive. But okay, so yeah. on that note, what should <laughs> what do you think the left should perhaps like politically prioritize right now? So in the beginning of the interview, you talked about civil liberties being a very important I think it's, um, we, aspect for you. The left needs to prioritize capitalism and exploitation and not all these various That's oppressions, it. right? Mm -hmm. And also within that, the ruling class. I'm working on an essay now that's about this, which is like, you know, you've got capitalism, which is the whole society, which is dominated by capital, by the process of capital and by the capitalist class. But there's, there's, pre-capitalist and non-capitalist elements to the society. So they've got capitalism, that's the whole society and the state's part of that, right? You've got capital, the social process of the private ownership of the means of production, uh, you know, buying labor as a commodity to produce other commodities, to sell into competitive markets, to get more money. This, you know, this is the, the cancer cell of capitalism. You've got capital, but then you've also got the capitalist class and that class is, more starkly apparent than ever, these oligarchs. And so, I mean, we need a politics that focuses on capital, on capitalism and changing capitalism, overthrowing it or more seriously, you know, humanizing it and containing it with a clear idea of like capital and this whole process, this, you know, this social set of social relations that can colonize more and more of life. And then also this class, how there's a group of people who have agendas and have addresses and that they need to be targeted that because sometimes the problem can be that like capitalism is seemingly everywhere and capital is this like abstract process and it's also like a thing and a social process it's like capital goods like machinery but it's also this social process a style of ownership and exploitation right so there's ways in which the critique the marxist critique of capitalism can become too diffuse and too mm -hmm. nebulous. And one way to really kind of anchor that politically is to remember the ruling class, the 1%, right? That this is a struggle against the rich, right? Yes, it's a struggle against the system that produces that class and reproduces it, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also just like about these people. And there are very few working class people in the US who, um, who really, feel warmly towards the rich, you know, most working class people, even if they're quite conservative and identify as Republicans are, it seems to me like a pretty, pretty aware of uh, the inequality and unfairness of this. And they don't think that there should be this class of oligarchs. And, and people are also increasingly aware that the 1% is much, much richer than it used to be. Mm. I was just reading something about how when the, the first um, Forbes richest 
500 people or whatever it was list came out like the richest man at the time, if you controlled for inflation today, he would have $9 billion. Like I think at the time he had like 1.2 or something like that. Wow, he had $9 billion. <laughs> I mean, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos. Poor guy. guy. <laughs> yeah, who knows? I mean, they probably lost $25 billion in the last two weeks. Two of minutes. Stock market yeah. collapse. But it's like they, they were both at one point were worth a hundred billion dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That really uh, puts yeah. it into perspective. So yeah. hopefully we can have you on again once you once you have your next essay or article. article. Out. All right. Well, I'll, I'll keep you guys on the list. I'll send you anything I write. And um, thank, thank you. you again for having me on. And good luck with everything. It's been great talking with you guys. Thank you. Same here. And so I'll put the link to Christian's article down below. If not, it's on the gray zone. You can find it quite easily. And yes, Sam, do you have any final words or should I wrap it up? No, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't. <You> don't have... <laughs> okay, well, thank you very for watching and thank you again, Christian. So please like and subscribe and we'll see you in our next video. Thank you. All right, see you.